Good morning, everyone. Uh, so it is my great pleasure to uh, to welcome you to this other to this new uh, appointment of our forty under forty uh, lecture series on combustion. It is uh, my great pleasure to introduce uh, Ronan Viclan, um, uh, whom I know very very well. Uh, Ronan received his uh, doctoral degree in energetics from Ecole Centrale Paris. He was then a postdoctoral scholar at the Stanford, Stanford University, where he joined, uh, and then he joined, uh, uh, sorry, Central Suvelec again in 2011 as an assistant professor in the EM2C uh, CNRS laboratory. Uh, since 2019, he has been appointed the full professor at Central Suvelec, uh, now member of uh, Université Paris Saclay, uh, and uh, is currently the head of the Aerospace and Transport Engineering graduate program. Uh, his research interests include combustion, turbulence, in transfer and multi-physics simulation, in particular conjugate heat transfer and thermal radiation. Uh, his activity combines high fidelity simulation, modeling, and joint experimental and numerical analysis. Uh, and in particular, his areas of, an, uh, of interest are aero engine ignition, oxyfuel combustion, and hydrogen combustion. So today, uh, Ronan, we talk about wall heat transfer and thermal radiation in combustion systems. And so I'm very uh, pleased uh, to uh, leave you the floor, uh, Ronan. Thank you again for having accepted our invitation. And uh, uh, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Alessandro, for this um, introduction. It's also a, a great pleasure. Uh, and uh, I thank uh, Great Lizzie. Belgium section of the Commission Institute for this uh, invitation. And so today, as you mentioned, we'll, uh, we'll talk about wall transfer and thermal radiation in uh, combustion systems. Um, but first, I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, my uh, co-workers in uh, EM2C uh, that have worked on uh, those different topics we're going to discuss today. And especially the guys in blue who are the graduate um, and graduated students and postdocs that have carried out the, the work. Uh, I also want to uh, acknowledge uh, the teams and my coworkers at Serfax and, and Korea. We've been working uh, together for many years, uh, fruitfully um, on the, these two codes, AVP and ELS2, that we are using also in, uh, in EM2C. So, combustion and heat transfer. So, Combustion, uh, of course, you know, is going to uh, produce burn gases, sometimes soot. You could also have flame wall interactions, and all this will generate wall transfer and thermal radiation. Uh, in return, uh, this will affect uh, efficiency of combustion and thermal efficiency, the flame stabilization, and the pollutant um, emissions. Okay, so this is one of many possible coupling aspects that could um, uh, occur in combustion systems. And the role of heat transfer depends on the application. In some of them, it's an issue and we want to minimize it. And in others, we want to maximize it. And to uh, determine then what is uh, happening in those systems. We will have to uh, detail uh, the, the three different modes of heat transfer that are conduction, convection, and radiation. So let's pick uh, an example on uh, the Perkins star burner, which is a configuration that has been uh, massively investigated by different teams. Uh, and it is actually also subject to uh, heat transfer. However, for many years uh, in this system and still today in other uh, burner configuration, people have dis uh, disregarded the world temperature effects. And is in these uh, different examples, adiabatic wall conditions were prescribed, which uh, is not critical in the core aspects of the flow in those studies, but clearly uh, close to the wall, you could see the mismatch in, uh, in the gas temperature close to the wall. But this has a uh, critical aspect on the flame shape because then in adiabatic LES, in this configuration, we predict an aim shape flame. Also, uh, experimentally, uh, what we should observe, what we hope, what we do observe is a V shape flame. So we will want to uh, account for these uh, wall losses. Okay, the first thing you, you, you may want is to know the actual wall temperature and, or heat resistance 
that uh, could be measured uh, experimentally, but sometimes we don't have access uh, to those measurements. And so you have to predict the wall temperature, and we'll uh, see that uh, later. Or, as done in this uh, study by uh, Benar et al., uh, you could uh, roughly estimate it. And so if you prescribe this uh, wall temperature in the large simulation, you can see on this image of enthalpy defects that inside the outer recirculation zone, the down gases are cooled down significantly, although the core of the flow is mainly adiabatic. This time, when you compare uh, to the experimental uh, signal, uh, your frame shape for the non-adiabatic case uh, here on the right, you do retrieve the V-shaped flame compared to the adiabatic case in the middle. And so this, uh, what we see is that the cooled burn gases have been able to quench the, uh, the flame branch located in the outer shear layer. And then the flame shape is properly retrieved. Now, if you don't want to roughly estimate the wall temperature, but to, you want to predict it, you're going to carry out a conjugate heat transfer simulation. And we'll have different solvers and we'll have one solving for heat conduction inside the solid domain. So usually this is done in a, with a parallel algorithm where each solver is going to advance in time. And usually through what we call a dirichlet Neumann scheme, the fluid solver will uh, use a wall temperature predicted by the solid heat transfer solver. And reciprocally, uh, the wallet flux on the solid solver will be uh, set from uh, the prediction of the um, fluid solver. Um, so there are some challenges in assembling uh, these kind of simulations, dealing with interpolation on the, uh, at, at the interface between both solvers. So determination of the coupling period, how often do we exchange this uh, information? And sometimes we can have some uh, stability issues that can be enhanced, for example, with a, a directly robust uh, communication scheme. That is a little bit different. Now, it's not the only uh, difficulty. Uh, the solid transient heating times can take some minutes to hours in practical systems, which is totally uh, uh, unaffordable for physical times we can afford in, uh, in LES. And so usually, uh, most often, people will use an asynchronous exchange and accelerate by a given factor alpha the uh, transient in the solid part. Okay, But this uh, kind of study then enables to uh, uh, reach the steady state much sooner. Now let's see another example of application uh, with uh, CHT, conjugate heat transfer this time, on a, a flame dynamic study by, by Cross. Uh, you see here the experimental uh, device with a visualization of the flame. And when you carry out now a conjugate heat transfer simulation, you will not only simulate the flow inside your combustion chamber, but you will also mesh all the solid parts to account to uh, determine where heat conduction is uh, going. But uh, solving uh, the water temperature with uh, CHT is not a, a magic solution because you're just pushing the problem further away uh, from the inner wall because at some point you need to prescribe boundary conditions, okay? And that uh, can be uh, critical and you need to pay attention on the heat transfer coefficient you, you prescribe there. Uh, you, you could have some uh, significant uncertainties. But here it's fine. Uh, you, uh, you could see uh, here's the predicted uh, flow uh, temperature in the, inside the combustor below the temperature in the solid part in the injector that can uh, be heated up to uh, 600 kelvins. If you uh, pay attention uh, at the flow, fresh gases flow inside the injector, you see that it is actually preheated by this uh, solid uh, part. And then in this specific configuration, it's only once you have, you've accounted for this preheating that you're able to correctly predicts the uh, combustion instabilities in this system. Okay, so here, uh, the effect of Foley transfer is a little bit more subtle and, uh, and impacts the flame dynamics, okay, which is not necessarily something you would expect initially. 
And so later on, we'll uh, detail an example on flame dynamics again, but this time on ignition, and we'll see how Wally transfer can also impact uh, ignition in gas turbines. What about thermal radiation also? Uh, so we have different quantities of interest to, to add to the picture. We'll have to predict the wall relative fluxes. And at each point inside the combustion chamber, we'll also need to describe the relative power field. This is determined by different uh, participants in, uh, in combustion applications, uh, the walls, obviously, but also the participating uh, gases, which are mainly CO2 and H2O, that have uh, a complex spectrum of relative properties to describe. And in many applications, we also need to describe uh, hot uh, particles uh, and the corresponding uh, relative heat transfer from those, such as uh, soot particles, but I will not uh, detail uh, this part uh, further today. So in the recent uh, years, uh, there have been uh, many advances in copper simulation with radiation, and you can have a look in detail at, at uh, this book from uh, Modest and Howers. You have to pick a different kind of solvers, P1, DOM, Monte Carlo, or, or some others. You also need to describe the, the gas relative properties. And along the years, we've uh, switched from a canonical uh, flame configuration with a uh, crude approximation of the gas properties to actual uh, flame simulations with realistic uh, uh, gas properties, then to more detailed gas properties and even line-by-line -line spectrums in uh, free jet flame simulations. And there have been some recent examples where this is uh, further combined with CHT. Uh, in a multi-physics framework, and uh, also uh, done here, uh, here with um, a detailed Monte Carlo server for radiation. Okay, so you, you see there that uh, it's quite active. However, uh, nowadays uh, there are still many applications that are neglecting thermal radiation, although it should not. Uh, in many cases, it's a first order effect. In many more, uh, it will have an effect, but not first order. We have a lot of applications in the literature with uh, free flames, but uh, much fewer uh, applications with thermal radiation in confined systems. And you can wonder then, when is thermal radiation even uh, further uh, important? Uh, this will be cases where we have extreme high temperature or high pressure, large scale systems, or high concentration of burnt gases or particles, okay? Mm -hmm. And I want to uh, highlight uh, a little bit more on uh, the high concentration of uh, burn gases um, examples. Many systems uh, features, uh, feature exhaust gas recirculations or in general combustion in vitiated mixtures. This is a common way to, uh, to control and mitigate uh, NOx emissions in uh, HCCI engine, in sequential combustors or in mild combustion. We can also find this kind of vitiated mixtures in some uh, nuclear safety uh, configuration, okay, where we can find uh, uh, hydrogen, air, and steam uh, mixtures. And in all those systems, the concentration of burnt gases is increased, and we expect a, a, a stronger effect of thermal radiation. And so later on, I will uh, detail you uh, an example where we've investigated the effect of exhaust gas recirculation in uh, H2 flames. Uh, finally, uh, the extreme case with a uh, high concentration of uh, burnt gases is oxycombustion. Oxycombustion is a key technology, so one of different possibilities to uh, capture carbon from uh, fossil fuel combustion. So in oxycombustion, we are removing the uh, nitrogen from air and carry out uh, combustion, for example, with methane and pure O2. And then in the exhaust ga gases, we don't find any nitrogen and zero NOx at all. So that's the extreme case where we have very high concentration of CO2 and also H2O. And there have been uh, many studies okay, uh, dealing with the stabilization of such uh, oxy flames because the chemistry of these flames is also modified when you dilute uh, with um, CO2. And so later on, I will detail you uh, well the uh, uh, heat transfer aspect uh, we can uh, look at in, the, in such uh, oxy combustion systems. With that, I arrive at the contents uh, for this uh, presentation. 
uh, we will uh, detail, we will uh, go over an example of with a flame dynamics again here with light wand ignition where volley transfer can have a, an, uh, an effect. I will spend most of the time uh, on this uh, use case uh, coupling thermal radiation in an oxy um, combustor. And I'll uh, finish briefly with the radiative effect in uh, steam diluted H2 flames. So in the first two examples, we are going to uh, determine what are the uh, heat transfer at the combustor scale. Okay, so it's a system scale uh, analysis. And the last point is more at a microscopic scale, and we are going to wonder if uh, the fundamental uh, flame properties can be uh, modified by uh, radiation, for example. Okay, so let's start uh, with the first one. Uh, and the contact is engine restart. When you want to uh, certify an engine, there are many things you want you need to go through, and one of them is uh, the assessment of uh, reignition and restart which according to the certification documentation has to investigate two scenarios, a quick relight where the flame is uh, suddenly uh, blow, blown off and you need to restart within uh, seconds. And a much more difficult case of altitude relight when after a, a long period, you, you need to make sure that you can reignite uh, the combustor. The wall conditions in the two cases are quite uh, different because in the first case, the walls are, are still uh, very hot from the previous stabilized uh, flames, while in the second case, uh, a long time has passed and uh, the walls are at uh, ambient conditions. So to study uh, ignition in actual systems, it's quite uh, difficult and, uh, and in many uh, places, uh, in the world, people have uh, developed these uh, multi burner configurations to investigate flame propagation. And the one we will uh, study uh, today is uh, the Mika spray investigated at, here at uh, EM2C. Um, and we will see a visualization of the ignition of the flame um, in this uh, configuration. So it features 16 injectors. And starting from a spark generation, we have a rapid uh, canal growth of the flame. We ignite the first burner and we have these two fronts igniting each burner successively. Okay, so this last phase of the, with the two flame front igniting the full uh, chamber is called the light round. Through so the different studies uh, here and elsewhere, uh, many uh, mechanisms have been understood on um, flame propagation in annular systems. And today we will uh, investigate the effect of wall temperature. You see here the results in terms of light round duration. So the time the flame takes to ignite the combustor for a given, uh, for a given um, operating condition. So here with some variability uh, in the equivalence ratio. The blue dots correspond to uh, the cold wall conditions and the orange dots correspond to the hot wall conditions, corresponding to a quick relight where the flame was stabilized with a switch of the fuel supply and then switch it back on again and reignite. And uh, we see a drastic difference in terms of light one duration. Okay, so there was a factor two between both cases. And so what uh, we, we've tried recently is uh, to uh, understand uh, these uh, effects for numerical uh, simulations. So we've carried out large eddy simulations with the FVP solver uh, from Fairfax. Here, the fuel, uh, the solid condition correspond to liquid NF10. Um, the dispersed spray is uh, described by the Lagrangian approach, combustion by a second flame model with a, a global mechanism. To uh, discretize uh, full geometry, uh, we have more than 300 million uh, tetrahedral cells. And uh, I want really to outline three key modeling features that have been assembled in this uh, case. Uh, the first one is dealing with a uh, wall convective uh, heat transfer, where uh, the impinging of very hot gases with cold walls, uh, we've observed that uh, the classical analytical uh, wall laws were not valid anymore, and we need it uh, to do uh, because of the strong variability of thermal physical properties with a change of temperature between the very hot gases and the very cold walls. 
And so we've uh, replaced then uh, classical laws or even more advanced one with a, a more evaluate, evaluated approach where we're actually solving for turbulent boundary layer equations to actually describe properly the, what it transfers for the turbulent uh, boundary layers. We also had to account for the polydispersity of the spray. And finally, the subgrid uh, wrinkling factor of the turbulent flame was described with a dynamic model. Okay, so we've put all of these advanced features together in these simulations. And so, what uh, when we look at uh, what is going on, the predicted flame shape, we qualitatively we we do see ex the exact same thing as the experiments. Uh, we start from a, a rapid expansion of an uh, initial kernel. We have two flame fronts, and they're igniting uh, successfully the different uh, injectors. When we compare the electron duration from the LES with uh, the cold wall conditions, as uh, prescribed here in the simulations, we are able to correctly retrieve the uh, uh, ignition uh, time. Uh, just to compare, you also have here the uh, LES result with adiabatic wall conditions, and you see that they step a little bit uh, aside from the experimental data, uh, meaning that there is indeed uh, an effect, even with cold walls, of uh, wall heat transfer. Now, when we want to uh, predict uh, ignition with uh, a quick relight now, so the walls are still hot from the previous stabilized flame, we need first to determine uh, this uh, hot wall temperature. So we're doing this with conjugate heat transfer. You see on the right, the fluid dom domain on one portion of the um, annular test rig and the corresponding solid domain. We are now also now meshing and we're solving heat conduction inside. As explained earlier, we need to uh, exchange information at the interface here using a directly Robin uh, exchange. And we also need to prescribe the external uh, information, meaning ex external heat transfer coefficients and radiation from the hot walls, which can be uh, which can introduce some uncertainties in our results. Okay, so before igniting, then what do we do? First, in steady in steady burning condition, we with conjugate heat transfer, we compute and predict the hot wall temperature field inside the walls. Then we prep for reignition now and a quick relight scenario. We fix this uh, hot wall conditions while filling fresh gases inside uh, the combustor, fresh gases with air and uh, N10. And we see uh, a strong evaporation a strong preheating of the fresh gases and a strong evaporation of the uh, F10 uh, droplets. Now that the initial conditions are set, we ignite and we are going to compare on the left the experimental visualization to a top view uh, of the LES results. And so both of them you will see are able to uh, retrieve uh, approximately uh, the same ignition time, meaning that uh, we've been able to uh, capture correctly uh, this uh, reduced light front duration due to the different wall conditions. So that's interesting. And now the question is why? So what is responsible for this uh, factor two? Um, so the first key features in this uh, expanding flames is the role of density ratio between unburned gases and burned gases, because as in spherical flames, the volumetric expansion will generate a flow that accelerates strongly the flame. When we compare uh, in blue line uh, this density ratio for the cold wall condition, we see that it decreases because of the accumulating wall heat losses compared to the dashed line corresponding to the nominal adiabatic uh, density ratio. So that's the first difference compared to adiabatic. Now the preheated wall conditions are quite different because fresh gases are strongly preheated, which is going to change the unburned gases density. And the corresponding burned gases is also affected. And that's why we have a factor two then. However, it's not in the correct direction. We see that the density ratio has been reduced 
And this aspect alone would significantly decelerate the flame. It will, it would not accelerate it. So something else is um, taking place. Uh, and uh, the first thing is that we've seen that we've uh, actually evaporated most of the uh, droplet mist in the preheated world conditions. So this is going to change the flame propagation pattern. And also because of the strong preheating of fresh gases, the laminar flame speed has been modified significantly. And so it's the combination of all these aspects that is responsible for uh, the shortening of the um, light one duration between a quick relight scenario and a, a restart from ambient world temperatures. Okay, so that's a nice example where, again, we've seen that a flame dynamic can be impacted by a water transfer, uh, which is not uh, necessarily what uh, you expect initially, okay, because water transfer is not here necessarily a first order effect you, you could have uh, anticipated. Now I'll, I'll spend some more time on a, a detail, a specific use case with oxy combustion. So we're going to investigate this um, OxyTech uh, chamber that features uh, premixed oxy combustion studied by uh, Paul Jourdain with uh, Thierry Schuller's group in uh, in n 2 c You see here the chamber. Uh, the injector is a swirler with a given coil. And we are going to investigate two different flames. First flame is uh, N2 diluted. And the second flame is an oxy flame for oxy combustion, where we've replaced uh, nitrogen with uh, CO2 in the fresh gases. Both flames have the, have the very same equivalence, global equivalence ratio, the very same uh, thermal power, same swirl. So dilation uh, of fresh gases um, has been set such that both flames have the very same adiabatic flame temperature. And the similar ratio of bulk velocity in the injector versus uh, the laminar flame speed are similar to retrieve the, a similar stabilization. So these are also very different. They are very similar flames. Okay, They have the very same, same stabilization, same adiabatic temperature, and same thermal power. Uh, one thing, though, we, we expect to change is uh, thermal radiation, because in the latter case, the concentration of CO2 is much, much higher, and we expect a, a larger effect on uh, water transfer. So this has been measured uh, by uh, Arthur de Genève, uh, where we've measured um, on the optical windows uh, the wall temperature along the center line for each case, both at the inner side of the windows and at the outer side. And from these sets of temperatures, we can also estimate, uh, from the difference of temperatures, we can estimate a total heat flux then going through the, the windows and then determine uh, the total um, heat flux in, in those experiments. And what was quite surprising is to see that both flames features roughly the same total heat flux at the walls. So that was a surprise, and that's what we are going to um, try to understand later on. And why is it a surprise? Because it's quite uh, counterintuitive, at least uh, initially. Um, why is that? Remember that the flames, they have the same thermal power, they have the same adiabatic flame temperature, they have the same shape, they also have a quite similar Reynolds number, so we expect similar wall convective heat fluxes. But because of the much higher CO2 concentration in the oxy flame, we expect a much stronger total radiative um, heat transfer in the second case. But this is not uh, what is seen uh, from uh, the left, uh, from the figure on the left. Uh, which features similar total heat fluxes. Okay, so there's something to understand there, and we will investigate this uh, more in detail with coupled LDS with thermal radiation. So we'll go through uh, the methodology first and the result for both flames and see that uh, at the end we can propose a, a low order model to, to explain the results. 
In terms of methodology, we need to solve the radiative transfer equation when we need uh, when we deal with thermal radiation. You can do this with multiple kinds of solvers with different sets of models for gas relative properties. Some choices are good, some are not, some are reasonable. Uh, it's quite similar to the choices you do with uh, your fluid solver and your combustion models. And in this work, uh, we are going to combine LES, large LED simulation, with Monte Carlo, uh, Monte Carlo solver of thermal radiation and a narrow band model for gas relative properties, which is, uh, I would say, uh, a very nice effort to get things uh, accurate in terms of um, heat transfer in the combustor. Few words about the radiative uh, solver we're using. It's called Rainier. It's a Monte Carlo solver. It's an, actually a backward Monte Carlo solver, meaning that at any point where we want to compute a relative power or relative heat flux, we are tracing a rays backwards to get uh, the quantities of interest locally. We are counting for radiation from CO2 and H2O only using a corrected K and narrow band model. Here, suits are negligible and we will not discuss uh, their modeling. Now, a common issue with a Monte Carlo solver is their slow convergence, meaning that the Monte Carlo arrow is decreasing very slowly with the number of uh, rays you are tracing at each point in your domain. However, you should, you should not uh, stop there because there are many improvements you can do to enhance uh, the improvement and the uh, numerical efficiency, the scalability of your solver, the load balancing. And we can actually act on both the numerator and denominator of the, of the Monte Carlo error, <clears throat> either with important sampling or with um, quasi Monte Carlo, which is an approach we've uh, been involved to in, um, in the M2C. <clears throat> okay, so once we have a radiation solver, we are going to couple it to our LES code, which is here again, um, FVP. And so the LES is uh, feeding the composition, temperature, and pressure field to the relative heat solver. And the relative solver is sending back the relative power inside the chamber to the flow solver. So we are using a 50 million cell mesh uh, with a second flame model again. The Monte Carlo solver is using uh, 1,700 CPU cores, which is uh, larger than the number of cores used for LES. With a cursor mesh, we fix also the uncertainty of the Monte Carlo solver to 3%. We also uh, uh, did some a priori study to set the coupling period, determining at which frequency we're going to exchange information between both solvers. <clears throat> Okay, and finally, to get uh, conjugated transfer out of the picture here, we are prescribing uh, the measured wall temperature on the inner side of the windows inside the simulations. Okay, and so you do see here that Monte Carlo is indeed uh, still expensive, okay, uh, and we need to pay attention uh, solely uh, <clears throat> to how much we curse on the mesh and how much we uh, we uh, couple the information with LES to make sure that we are doing uh, all those. It's not to have a correct uh, <clears throat> compromise in terms of CPU cost and accuracy. We also need to pay attention to boundary condition and wall emissivities. And specifically here, we have large optical access. And uh, you all know about the greenhouse effect in your uh, windows and uh, your viewing windows uh, in those experiments are definitely semi-transparent then. And that's a little bit tough to account for in many systems. It's easy to do with a Monte Carlo solver. And it's quite a big deal here because uh, we'll see later on that actually 50% of the incoming radiative flux at the windows is actually transmitted through the windows. Okay, so the windows are not opaque at all. They are not transparent at all. They are semi-transparent. And we are modeling this by considering bands in the spectrum, either as fully transparent or fully opaque. 
OK, so let's see the results now for the N2 diluted flame first. We compare here the predicted velocity feed for the reactive conditions. And we see uh, similar characteristics, uh, a slight discrepancies in the magnitude of the axial velocity that we attribute to the strong sensitivity of the experiment to the coal angle of the injector. So when we look at uh, specific profiles, we do retrieve on the axial, mean axial velocity, some um, uh, larger velocities on the numerical side. But on the profile of RMS in axial velocity, it's very nice. And uh, same in uh, the radial velocity profiles. OK, so this is, I would say, quite satisfactory. Regarding the flame uh, shape, um, uh, we are comparing here the uh, Abel deconvoluted uh, OH star chemiluminescent signal to the heat release uh, rate map. So classical commands, they are not totally uh, uh, comparable, but that, that they tell uh, us about the flame position. And we see that we have a, a slightly shorter flame, which is a little bit uh, entered inside the injector inside the simulations. No, it, it happens that uh, this uh, turbulent flame is quite uh, challenging, in fact, because uh, we do see on the different uh, snapshots, experiments or, um, or LDS, that we have a very strong intermittency of the, of the, of the turbulent flame, okay? it, uh, which makes the uh, turbulent uh, combustion modeling quite challenging, I would, uh, I would say. So now that we are confident in our results, we are going uh, to look at the uh, global uh, entropy balance inside the combustor. So out of the 14 kilowatts uh, corresponding to the same wall power, 40% uh, are going are lost at the wall from uh, convective heat transfer. 20% are lost for radiation. And the remaining 40% uh, uh, correspond to the reduced uh, uh, exhaust gas temperature at the exit. When you detail a little bit what's going on in terms of radiation, 40% uh, of the uh, radiative contribution is going uh, is absorbed at the quartz. A similar contribution is actually going through uh, the transparent bands of the windows. And the rest is absorbed at uh, the opaque walls or is uh, exiting at the outlet of the domain. Now for this uh, N2 dil diluted flame, very similar to any conventional flames at atmospheric pressure, thermal radiation is not negligible at all. Okay, And absorption specifically is not negligible also. It accounts for 70% of the total emitted power inside your system. Okay, So definitely, if you neglect absorption with an optically thin model there, you are making a huge mistake. We can now compare our wall heat flux predictions to the total heat flux we've seen previously. The wall convic convective flux uh, is plotted there above. Uh, we have a peak on the center line corresponding to the impinging of burnt gases from the swirled uh, jet flames. On the radiative uh, heat flux at the walls plotted uh, below, we see that it's uh, smaller, it's uh, stronger uh, for the colder part of the windows. So when we sum, when we sum the two contributions, we can compare this to the total uh, heat flux uh, measured experimentally, and we have, uh, I would say, a, a very nice result. We have a, a shift that we attribute to the incorrect uh, flame position and position of the uh, central recirculation zone, but the magnitude is uh, nicely retrieved. Okay, so the peak at the wall is uh, clearly dominated by the wall convective uh, heat transfer due to the impinging of burnt gases, but on the upstream part and downstream part, uh, we have the correct. Uh, magnitude only because of the similar magnitude of convective transfer and relative transfers. Okay, so already this N2 diluted flame is already a subtle balance between convective and relative fluxes. 
and I will uh, go through with the COT diluted flame results to see how this can be uh, modified. So there are a couple of things uh, to uh, to change in the CO2 simulations. Uh, we've adapted uh, the chemistry to CO2 dilution, and we and we didn't had at that time the same uh, CPU budget, and so we've uh, coarsened. Uh, significantly more the simulation to be uh, for it to be more affordable. I will not detail all this, uh, but it's nice to have an idea of the uh, computational time there. Uh, you see uh, that for the residence time in the combustor, the uh, coupled simulation for N2 flame uh, uh, costed more than 1 million CPU hours. And after uh, some uh, refactoring and simplifications and coarsening of the meshes, uh, the coupled uh, CO2 flames is uh, only uh, is lower than a half a million CPU hours. So when we compare the two results, uh, we see a much stronger reabsorption of uh, radiation in the CO2 diluted flame. That's expected because the concentration is much higher. We have much higher, much much higher emission. But correspondingly, we have a much higher reabsorption of this emission. And at the end, then, we don't have a huge effect on radiative uh, heat losses, OK? 20%, as we've seen in the N2 diluted flame, and now 26% uh, in this case. OK, so now we are going back to the total uh, budget of heat transfer and see what is going on between uh, the non-coupled case and coupled results. Let's first go back to the non-coupled uh, results. You have here in a uh, light brown, uh, the total what it losses due to convective heat transfer. Okay, so those are the losses predicted by the non-coupled and standalone LES. On top of that, we can also carry out uh, without coupling uh, at all, a standalone simulation of using the Monte Carlo solver and add on top of it uh, an a priori estimation of the uh, radiative uh, total heat loss. And we see that we are retrieving somehow what we anticipated initially, okay, is that uh, we, the non-coupled results are telling us that Yes, we, we, we do expect some uh, larger uh, heat losses uh, and heat transfer in the CO2 case. But again, this is not what we've seen previously, OK? So definitely, there is something going on uh, with our APR estimation, which is current with a non-coupled result, uh, but not with reality. Besides, uh, we see that there is something that is not physical because the, tot the cumulated total heat losses there is uh, above the total uh, thermal power of the combustor. When we look at the coupled result energy budget, uh, now we have the in light brown still the convective uh, heat losses at the walls but from the coupled simulations, and now in a darker brown, uh, the coupled results contribution for thermal radiation. You do see now that in the coupled simulations, the uh, relative contribution has been reduced significantly, and the convective part has changed slightly also. And, uh, and more specifically, we do see that now they have the same order of magnitude. OK, so the coupled simulations are able to retrieve what we've seen experimentally. The total heat transfer in both cases are, consist are similar. OK, so the coupled simulations are doing a nice job, OK, but we still haven't understood why. So what did we miss previously in our uh, a priori assessment is that uh, we've uh, actually fixed the, world, the gas temperature. And in reality, thermal radiation is changing. So wall, the gas temperature inside the combustor. We can uh, see this uh, here clearly. This is a CO2 diluted flame. We are looking at uh, the average temperature inside the combustor. And we have uh, almost 200 Kelvin difference 
in terms of average temperature between non-coupled and coupled simulations. And it's even larger for the um, exhaust gas uh, temperature. So in fact, uh, thermal radiation is not adding thermal radiation alone. Thermal radiation will affect the total relative heat losses, but also the convective heat losses because the global temperature inside the combustor is modified by thermal radiation. Okay. So once we couple the different solvers, we obtain a, a new balance between radiative heat losses and convective heat losses compared to uh, what non-coupled simulations and a priori estimations would say. Okay, so that's interesting. Okay, and we see that we can under understand this a little bit better with a, a lower model. And we can even predict the coupled results from non-coupled uh, results. So this lower model, its starting point is a macroscopic balance of energy inside the combustor. So total thermal power is a balance with the difference of enthalpy between the outlet and inlet and the losses, the convective uh, heat losses and the radiative heat losses. The change of enthalpy between outlet and uh, inlet is just uh, the mass flow rate times Cp and the difference of temperature. We are going to uh, model um, the convective heat losses with a global thermal resistance accounting for those effects. And we've introduced uh, something similar for relative heat losses. Um, also, it's a little bit more tricky, uh, but we've also defined uh, relative uh, resistance uh, here. When you put all the bricks together, then uh, you obtain this formula, there, but there's still a, 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 an unknown uh, that we want to, to get rid of is uh, the outlet temperature compared to the average temperature. So for this, uh, we've introduced an approximation and estimated that the difference between the outlet temperature and the average temperature in the combustor is due to a fraction of the total heat losses. And this fraction is denoted by uh, the factor A. So once then we go back to the global formula, we have one unique formula to predict the average uh, temperature in the combustor. We have some parameters in this uh, global model. We have this uh, fraction uh, factor A there and the thermal resistances for convective heat losses and radiative losses. For a given case, uh, we need to fit those. Uh, now, one exercise could be to actually fit them from coupled results to exactly match the coupled result, but that would be cheated and not very interesting. We will actually set these three different parameters from non-coupled simulations. Okay, so that's important. Meaning that the fraction A and the convective resistance are going to be determined from the LES alone simulations. And with a, Monte, a standalone Monte Carlo simulation, we are going to also determine the radiative resistance. Okay, and we obtain the numbers that you, you see there. So to understand a little bit more the physics going on there, uh, we can plot the behavior of the loader modeling when we change the thermal radiation inside. Okay, so we have we have three terms, okay, uh, that are equilibrated by the uh, total uh, thermal power without any radiation corresponding to an infinite uh, radiative resistance. We have only the first two contributions. And you see there the corresponding um, heat fluxes. As soon as you introduce radiation in the global model, meaning that when we decrease this uh, radiative uh, resistance, we are increasing, in, we are introducing a, a radiative system and uh, we see its contribution there in the balance. But since the sum of the three terms is fixed for a, a, a full efficiency in the combustor, the other two contributions, the, the sum of them, has to reduce. Okay, and we actually see that the uh, convective heat flux is uh, decreasing as we increase the effect of radiation. 
Also, uh, in the convective uh, contribution with, for a fixed wall temperature and a fixed uh, convective uh, resistance, we will predict that uh, the average uh, temperature inside the combustor will uh, decrease when we play with this uh, radiative resistance. Okay, so this model, okay, by varying here artificially uh, the impact of thermal radiation, it's able to predict uh, an average wall temp an average temperature inside the combustor, and it's also able to see the modified balance of uh, what it fluxes as I modify radiation. And you do, do see that when you increase radiation, you are also affecting the other contributions that are due to um, convective heat losses. Okay, so this is nice, and this is illustrating what is going on, but we can also check if the model is accurate. <clears throat> and so we will compare the loader model, which is only fed from non-coupled results, with the actual and expensive coupled results. So from the non-coupled results, we actually compute a, a, a given radiative uh, resistance, and we have then the corresponding prediction of average temperature and heat fluxes inside the combustor. And we can compare in, uh, here in diamonds to the coupled simulation results. And they are quite close, okay? We have uh, an uh, error that is uh, less than 10% on the different quantities. Okay, so that's very interesting because we were even able from, from non-coupled results to predict the correct redistribution between convective heat losses and radiative heat losses from this uh, low-order model, okay? And the uh, very same thing is uh, happening nicely with um, N2 diluted flame uh, results. Okay, so all of this uh, theory uh, is uh, is nice, I and mean, it's not only uh, uh, valid for uh, oxic combustion, okay? You can use the same recipes and the same methodology to study any, uh, any turbulent flames, okay? Where you want to account for thermal radiation, and you will see in many cases, a modification, an adaptation of the convective heat losses. Okay. Okay. To finish uh, briefly, I just wanted also to, uh, after uh, having uh, seen uh, two different systems where we've seen volume transfer in actual combustors, I want to uh, outline that thermal radiation that uh, can also affect uh, laminar flames properties. So the effect of exhaust gas recirculation on uh, laminar flame speed in a uh, premix combustion is uh, has been widely studied. Uh, it's also already well known in uh, hydrogen, as you see here on the right, that when you increase uh, dilution with uh, with steam, uh, you will decrease the laminar flame speed due to different effects, uh, chemistry, uh, dilution, uh, and and so on. But another possible effect is that when when you add steam in fresh gases you allow now also to have thermal uh, to, to have um, thermal radiation exchanges between burnt gases and fresh gases and this is something that is known for methane oxy combustion where people have seen that uh, when you add burnt gases inside into the fresh gases you will increase the laminar flame speed and we wanted to know uh, to we wanted to know how much this was uh, the case for H2 air uh, steam flames. So to do that, we've, uh, we are doing a uh, flamelet uh, computation with detailed chemistry. You were using here the Varga mechanism with detailed transport using here multi-component and survey effects to retrieve very nicely uh, in uh, H2 air without any steam. We are able to retrieve very nicely uh, state-of-the-art uh, experimental data for the laminar flame speed. But now we are adding, uh, in the steam diluted cases, a new term, which is uh, an effect of thermal radiation in the transport equation for temperature. So we, are now we will now couple uh, these uh, flamelet equations to uh, thermal radiation in 1D. So we're not using a Monte Carlo there. We can do this more efficiently and even exactly in 1D. And we are coupling these two solvers together to uh, obtain converged results. So let's see first uh, what is happening on a gray gas system. Okay, so gray gas uh, is uh, obviously a, a wrong exception. Okay, but we'll uh, be able to uh, to fix our ideas on what's going on there. 
So the conditions studied here is for five atmosphere with 500K uh, uh, temperature in fresh gases, an equivalence ratio of the order of eight. And the total mass fraction of uh, steam in fresh gases is uh, 30%. So the converged results we obtain are here. Uh, you see on the left, the temperature profile in space. And we have in dashed lines the detailed chemistry in adiabatic conditions. And now the same detailed uh, chemistry in transport with radiative power in plane line. So the first thing that you can see, and uh, I forgot to add like this is an infinite domain, uh, we see a strong preheating of fresh gases, okay? On the right, we have the profile of radiative power. On the burn gases side, we see a strong emission as expected. But now the new thing with uh, steam dilution is that we are able to reabsorb this emitted radiation inside the fresh gases. And so this is generated a strong preheating there associated with a, a new extrema in temperature. And when we look at the final laminar flame speed that we get, so relative change in laminar flame speed is huge. In this case, it's more than 200%. Okay, so it's a very high uh, preheating is generating a very high uh, laminar flame speed. In a finite domain, I will jump, I will skip this quickly. In a finite domain, the effect is much more reduced. Okay, now we don't have an infinite time to reabsorb uh, the emitted radiation. And in this example, the effect is only 25% on the laminar flame speed. But a gray gas is, is, does not exist. Okay, gray gas assumption is not valid. And uh, this is highlighted there with a plot of the uh, band average emissivity. And we will now uh, carry out actual results with um, uh, an error bond model for the gas relative properties. So the profiles of temperature and relative powers with, that we see here are now actual physical results. Okay, We are now coupling detailed chemistry, detailed transport, detailed solving of radiation, and detailed radiative properties for the gases. Uh, and for this actual physical flame, we are predicting uh, a 50, more than 50% change in, uh, in the laminar flame speed. Okay, so that's quite large effect. This has been investigated in many conditions. Uh, and uh, as soon as you are high pressure with uh, enough dilution level, you will see a large effect on the laminar flame speed on the right there. And they are always correlated with a strong preheating in those cases, as seen on the right. OK, so we are quite convinced that, yes, thermal radiation in the steam diluted uh, hydrogen flame will have a, a strong effect. But when we compare it to experimental data, it's quite uh, challenging. OK, you have ensembled different uh, data in the literature. Um, so Black plane line are adiabatic flame results we've carried out, and the dashed line is a, a coupled result with thermal radiation. Okay, so it gets us closer to the experimental data. In some cases, with large dilution, as here uh, with a result from Lamoureux, we are very close to the actual uh, data. But it must be said that it's quite uh, uh, there is some uh, discrepancies in comparing 1D laminar flame result with spherical with data from spherical flames. And the reason is that 1D radiation is not the same thing as spherical radiation. Uh, okay. Uh, so there is some things to, to improve, okay, in the post-processing of spherical flame experiments and also in our own uh, flame uh, computations. But definitely uh, the state-of-the-art uh, result with adiabatic flames that see some mismatch with experiments, some part of this mismatch is definitely uh, can definitely be att attributed to um, thermal radiation effects. With this, I arrive uh, at the end with a little bit of delay, sorry. Uh, and I want to end with some uh, takeaway messages, OK? We've uh, seen that uh, when it transfer uh, effects uh, needs to uh, to be accounted in many systems. This is expected in many of them. And in some of them, uh, we don't uh, necessarily anticipate uh, it could uh, affect our results. Uh, 
to predict um, uh, the world temperature, uh, we see more and more uh, experiments that are sensitive to the um, characterization of world temperature, even though water transfer is not the focus of the study. They know that uh, it's essential to uh, prescribe them in uh, numerical simulations. We see more and more uh, conjugate heat transfer uh, simulations in the literature, but you need to pay attention to the external boundary conditions that are prescribed there. Regarding coupling with thermal radiation, uh, I've said a few words about uh, a cost accuracy uh, compromise, so you need to be careful about this, and not only with Monte Carlo, but also with other approaches. You've seen that Monte Carlo methods are not necessarily prohibitive, and there is a, a, a big deal with wall properties, okay? If uh, the walls are, are not gray or not opaque, uh, you will uh, we need some data to know uh, what to prescribe in our numerical simulations. Regarding uh, decarbonate combustion and radiation, there's a lot of things to explore. Uh, we've seen that hydrogen flames are quite sensitive to preheating, and so we've seen it with radiation, but definitely conjugate heat transfer as seen in the introduction in the example, could have an effect. Uh, we've seen uh, different teams uh, working with metallic particles. They are also uh, they also undergo a significant uh, thermal radiation. Ammonia flames uh, are expected to be quite sensitive to heat losses, and uh, it would be also interesting to study soot radiation for uh, with uh, sustained radiation uh, fuels. The slide uh, to finish, uh, there are a couple of examples combining uh, large simulation, conjugated transfer, and radiation. We have here some uh, nice examples from the University of Florence, from Cerfax, and we've done a couple of, own, uh, couple of them uh, ourselves in the EM2C. Now we are mixing three solvers. Okay, these are quite uh, challenging setups to assemble. Uh, there are a lot of modeling uh, challenges in each solver already. Uh, and to validate this thoroughly, this needs uh, quite a lot of effort from our colleagues on the experimental side to validate each contributions there. Okay, but definitely, I think uh, I would think this is uh, the way to go for system level uh, predictions. With this, I'd like to thank you, and I I'll try to answer a couple of questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Renan, for uh, this very nice talk. Um, I uh, I open the the session for questions. If there are questions uh, from the audience, I will maybe start with the question while the people warm up a little bit. So I think one of the messages of your presentation is that we uh, we need this multi physics. Uh, uh, simulations and we also need to look a little bit uh, beyond the classic boundary conditions that we are usually used to apply in a sense. I think what we see with new fuels and also with interaction with the with the, um, uh, with the elements that are interacting with flames, we, we do see that we are kind of uh, uh, feeling the boundary conditions in our simulations because I make the example, I do the example of, uh, I would uh, try to make one example with hydrogen flames. There is these uh, questions about how these hydrogen flames would be impacting, for instance, the quality of materials. So my question is, uh, we should go towards a multi-physics simulation for sure, but there is also a need to a little bit extend uh, the, let's say, the, the, the domains of our uh, computation. Do you think this will actually impose uh, Constraint is it something that uh, it's feasible according to you? Uh, I don't know. I want to. I want to have your opinion on that. Well, clearly, uh, well, so what has changed? I would say compared to the last ten years, okay, and yeah. uh, comparing to what people have been doing uh, <clears throat> in CFDs, uh, in uh, academic and in, in, in industry, uh, people are now are fully aware that adiabatic world conditions. Are not acceptable, okay. Uh, but but in many cases, when heat transfer is not the big deal of the study, people are, are still using adiabatic conditions. But and sometimes it is, we do see some still remaining and significant mismatch with uh, when comparing with experimental data. And then 
people know that we need some information on the wall temperatures, okay? So the easiest job only for the people doing numerical simulations is to prescribe the wall temperature from the experiments, okay? Okay, that's the easiest part for the numerical guys. But of course, you're, we are putting the work then on the experimentalist to prescribe the wall temperature. Okay, but that's uh, something that is important to do, okay? Uh, and that's, that would be the first thing to try, okay? Um, <clears throat> Now, uh, but sometimes uh, we don't have access to, it's not measured, and so we need to predict it. And so you don't have any choice but to go through this conjugated transfer or um, some simple modeling of um, body transfer. And we're seeing uh, uh, many examples. For example, I mean, uh, we, there are many pa pa papers uh, nowadays from uh, the group at, at Fairfax. Um, and uh, it's uh, almost a, 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 a no-brain question, okay? By default, now, nowadays, you, you don't put adiabatic wall conditions. You, you need to, to prescribe some wall temperature or predict them. Okay. Just, just one thing to precise is uh, when you deal with thermal radiation, it will not be enough, okay? When you add thermal radiation, even though you have the thermal, uh, even uh, even if you have the wall temperature, thermal radiation will change what's going on inside the combustor. Okay. Yes, thank you, thank you. And I think, of course, we will uh, need to extend uh, beyond radiation to I don't know, maybe include the effect of materials, these kind of things. I think we are going, of course, in this direction. Um, uh, I think there is one question from uh, Pratiba. <coughs> Yeah. Hello. Hi. Yeah, hi. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Uh, I, I have some questions about the suit scattering properties, like how the accuracy of radiative heat transfer simulations uh, affected by the shoot properties, most specifically the scattering properties. Uh, yes. Uh, so, so you're right. Okay, in a, in I haven't uh, detailed this uh, part uh, in, in my talk. Sooted flames, uh, <clears throat> okay, once uh, the soot level is uh, is high enough, uh, will be uh, the elephant in the room. Okay, and they will uh, be the, the the major contributor to thermal radiation in uh, in sooted flames. Uh, and it's quite different uh, to predict compared to gases. As I said, the challenge, the spec troll properties of gases are very well known, but very complex to account for in detail. And it's uh, a little bit the opposite for uh, soot particles. In soot particles, their spectrum is much smoother, okay? And uh, the prediction, the solving of thermal radiation will be easier. However, the soot properties are much more uncertain. Okay, and, and that uh, is a whole field in itself. Okay, many teams are working on this. It's also very important for optical diagnostics, not just for wall heat transfer. And so, and it also depends. So it will depend on the refractive index, complex refractive index of your soot particles, on the morphology of your soot particles, and so on. And as you mentioned, if the suits are large enough, we also need to account for scattering, which is uh, something I haven't detailed there. Okay, the, the fact that the, the rays can be deviated um, uh, inside the domain. And so we've worked uh, a little bit uh, on this uh, too. Um, nowadays, uh, the consensus would be that suit scattering uh, is, uh, is negligible or very small, okay? But that's with some exceptions. The exception would be if you have very large suit aggregates, okay? So maybe in uh, heavy duty engines, okay? Like from marine transport, okay? Maybe uh, there, uh, the size of suit particles would could be so large that, uh, that uh, you would uh, have to uh, account for uh, scattering uh, properly. Thank you. That was that was very clear. Thanks. 
Thanks. Uh, I think there is, uh, sorry, there are a couple of questions on the chat. I will first give the word to the, with the people who want to raise their hands. So there is uh, uh, Salvatore and then uh, Lorenzo. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Ronan, for this very clear and yeah interesting presentation. Um, I just saw I have also a question. I have a question that is similar, very similar to the one that was already asked on on the chat, actually, because I'm noticing now. So sorry, I'm ready to kind of stealing your question, or I will uh, be your speaker uh, because I'm ready to ask what is the Nice. I mean, what model would you recommend? Radiation model would you recommend for a detailed, you know, a large scale combustion chamber simulation? That was also my question in the sense that you know, in industry it will be hard to use LES coupled with MC radiation. So, uh, in your opinion, what is the, the best uh, uh, choice uh, from the toolkit that we have of turbulence models, uh, solvers, and radiation chemistry, and so on that would guarantee the the desired, the best compromise, let's say, between accuracy and feasibility in, in, in the industrial context. And, and also related to this question, what is the role of reduce order models? What is, uh, um, are they going to be usable in industry? Are they, are they being used uh, right now? And if they can make a big impact to, to, on, on, on industry, uh, in industrial large scale simulation. Thank you. So on the first part, from my understood, uh, you ask about okay, what are the the correct uh, modeling choices for for thermal radiation, and then I'll I'll discuss on the uh, low order model part. Yeah, so you see here a different kind of uh, possible combination. Okay, uh, it's it's like uh, combining uh, LDS with different uh, turbulent chemistry or combustion or turbulent combustion closures. <clears throat> Well, there are some choices uh, I would say are forbidden nowadays, okay, uh, which are gray gas assumption, okay? Gas, it's been known for a century now, are not gray, <laughs> okay? So, and and we're still uh, seeing a lot of people using this or people highlighting how much gray gas are not uh, the same thing as actual gas properties, okay? So this is well known, okay? And you could still do some studies to see how much bad it is, but it's okay. Well, no, now that this is bad. Uh, most most people now will use a global model, okay, such as um, the weighted sum of gray gases, okay, or any of its variant, okay, SLW, ADBDF, and, and, and so on, okay, which is a good compromise uh, with uh, and when you combine them with. Uh, discrete ordinate methods or a finite volume uh, method, okay? Uh, and when you use a, a DOM solver or a finite volume solver, it's then, the, in fact, the only actual choice you have, okay? You cannot afford narrow band models or line by line models with a DOM solver in 3D cases. That's way too expensive. Now, what is very nice with Monte Carlo, is that uh, putting a crappy model or a very ac accurate one is the same cost, okay? So in Monte Carlo, we take then advantage, we could use global models, okay? It would be interesting to compare with the other approaches, okay? But it's actually roughly the same cost to include global models or urban models, or even uh, with some additional uh, additional cost or line by line model as done by uh, Modest and Howard studies. So that's why we usually see Monte Carlo with more detailed approaches, okay? Now, the level of accuracy depends. You can have uh, global models that are only 30% accurate, and you have uh, people deriving new global models, more advanced, that can be 10% accurate, okay? So it, it will depend on, uh, um, on your starting point there. Um, regain loader models, so yes, you're definitely right, okay? You've seen, I could have started from the loader model, and then uh, there would have been uh, no question raised initially, okay, in what I've shown. So this is very useful, okay, to uh, use uh, loader models. Uh, the message here is uh, for the industry or even all other academic research is not that 
it's only Monte Carlo and detailed properties. Okay. Uh, we need uh, the full spectrum of methods. Okay. The most advanced ones to challenge the others. The, uh, the best compromise in terms of 3D uh, modeling uh, simulations and all the things you can run in minutes or seconds. Okay. It's really important because when you will uh, want to optimize your system, you will want to uh, do a lot of uh, different modifications in your design, in your composition, and so on. And surely you will not launch the most advanced methods in, uh, in hundreds of computations, even for LES, okay, we, with a simpler model, okay? So all of them are highly wished for practical applications. And as I outlined here, for the physical analysis, okay, because you need to take some value out of the detailed information in your simulation to understand what is going on there. The lower order models are very useful also. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Lorenzo. Yes. Uh, I thank you for the very interesting presentation. I have uh, like uh, a little question about uh, ammonia combustion because. Uh, Okay, in general, like uh, uh, radiation models take into account uh, uh, CO2 and H2O as a like participant uh, species, but uh, what about the N2O? Like uh, it can have an effect on the radiation and uh, like models need to be, uh, you know, recalibrated to take into account also these, uh, let's say new species in for, uh, like new generation fuels. Uh, yes, I'm coming back to this point. Yes, excellent question on uh, on ammonia. Uh, so I have to work myself on on ammonia, but uh, uh, but surely uh, 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 question myself like 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 you did. Um, so N2O is uh, as I don't know the factor, but uh, you you know that methane has a much higher greenhouse effect than CO2, and N2O is even much higher than methane. Okay, so taking into account N2O uh, will be important depending on the molar fraction of N2O you get in uh, ammonia yeah. flames. Okay, so this I don't have any order of magnitude there, and so definitely this is something to pay attention at. It's also the case for ammonia itself. Ammonia is a uh, is a uh, complex molecule 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 like CO2 with vibrational and rotational levels. And so ammonia in fresh gases could also absorb uh, significantly radiation. Yeah. Okay, so uh, in ammonia flames, we need to look uh, into uh, radiative properties from ammonia, H2O, N2O. It will depend on the level of, level of N2O. It will depend on the, how much the spectrums uh, overlap between those different species. Um, so far, uh, I remember maybe four years ago at the uh, uh, International Symposium on Combustion, we've seen some preliminary uh, studies accounting for thermal radiation in ammonia flames, in 1D flames, but this was done with um, an optically thin assumption, so neglecting reabsorption, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, since then, uh, I believe uh, some papers have been uh, out there looking, in, looking into this. Uh, and so, yeah, your comment on N2O uh, is valid as soon as someone there in the room can tell us something about the order of magnitude and compare this to the its greenhouse, greenhouse uh, effect uh, potential. Yeah, makes sense. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks. I see that there is... Um... A uh, question from Madi about the experiments, but uh, so I was asking about experiments with other diagnostics, but uh, I don't know. Do you want to? Uh, uh, mm -hmm. It's a question from from whom? From Madi. So he says, I was wondering if you perf if you perform laser diagnostics, and if yes, if you did challenge with reflection, do we, with uh, did you have uh, so? So not okay. definitely, definitely not myself. Okay, you should not put any laser in my hands. Okay, uh, but uh, but okay, laser diagnostics are 
used exhaustively here in the lab in, uh, in EM2C. Um, so as, as you are mentioning, yes, <clears throat> we, it's a little bit, uh, it's quite difficult with all the reflections of the laser inside the annular setup, okay? So we don't, <clears throat> we've, They've done it. Um, so I'm thinking about my colleagues, okay, Sebastian Candel, Daniel Durox, and says this with uh, with uh, Guillaume Vignard, for example. Um, where they've uh, uh, they they've been able to, we haven't done any quantitative measurements inside the uh, annular test rig with laser diagnostics. Okay, the so configuration is a little bit too complex uh, to do this. Um, what else? If we see any flame asymmetry? Yeah, if you see if the different properties of walls could actually give asymmetries in the flame. Yeah, good question. Um, so experimentally, from shots to shots during ignition, uh, we do see uh, some asymmetries, okay? Sometimes the uh, two flame fronts with that we've seen, they merge at the opposite side of uh, where the spark was uh, deposited. And sometimes it's asymmetric. Uh, quite a lot. In our simulations, I don't know if you remember, but you um, uh, usually it's quite symmetric in our simulations, and we have some uh, also asymmetry. But so far, uh, we haven't been able to uh, study this systematically. We don't have any statistics on uh, on this, and. Um, and we haven't tried uh, at all to relate this to uh, to heat transfer effects. Okay, so I can't answer yet uh, definitely your your question. Okay, I think I don't know if there is any outstanding question. Uh, otherwise, I would like to thank you again, Ronan. This was a very nice talk as usual from you and uh, thanks for, for having accepted the invitation and uh, um, to all see you for the next appointment of this lecture series. Thank you very much. Ciao, bye-bye. Bye-bye.